A white lawyer humiliates a black boy who is at the door of his office, but when he talks to a client, but before we begin, where in the world are you watching from today? Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more captivating stories that will keep you on the edge of your seat. The polished marble floors of Hartley & Associates gleamed under the harsh fluorescent lights, reflecting the cold, impersonal atmosphere of the bustling law firm. At the center of this corporate labyrinth stood Maxwell Hartley, a name that struck fear and admiration in equal measure throughout the legal community of Boston. Maxwell's piercing blue eyes scanned the busy reception area, his perfectly tailored charcoal suit a stark contrast to the disheveled appearance of the young boy who had just stumbled through the glass doors. The child, no more than 12 years old, looked desperately out of place amidst the sleek modernity of the law firm's lobby. Can I help you? Maxwell's voice cut through the air, sharp and impatient. The boy, startled by the sudden attention, fumbled with a crumpled piece of paper in his hands. I, I'm looking for Mr. Hartley, the child stammered, his eyes darting nervously around the imposing space. Maxwell's lips curled into a sneer. Well, you found him. What could a kid like you possibly want with me? The boy swallowed hard, gathering his courage. My name's Tommy, sir. I, I need help. My mom, she's been... Stop right there, Maxwell interrupted, holding up a manicured hand. This is a prestigious law firm, not a charity organization. We don't handle playground disputes or lost cats. Now run along before security has to escort you out. Tommy's face fell, his eyes welling with tears. But sir, please, my mom's in trouble. She might lose her job and we could lose our home. I heard you were the best lawyer in Boston. I've been saving up my allowance, and I thought maybe... Maxwell's laughter echoed through the lobby, drawing curious glances from nearby paralegals, Nut and Associates. You thought you could hire me with your pocket money? That's rich, kid. Let me tell you something about the real world. It doesn't care about your sob stories or your piggy bank savings. Success is for those who earn it, not for those who beg for handouts. The lawyer's words hung in the air, each syllable a dagger to Tommy's young heart. The boy's shoulders slumped, defeat etched across his face. Maxwell, feeling a surge of cruel satisfaction, pressed on. Tell me, Tommy, what makes you think your mother deserves my help? What has she done to earn a place among my esteemed clientele? Tommy's voice trembled as he replied. She works two jobs, sir. She's never missed a day, even when she's sick. But her boss at the diner, he's been... Spare me the details, Maxwell cut in, waving dismissively. Your mother's work ethic, while admirable, is irrelevant in this context. This firm deals with high-profile cases, corporate mergers, and multi-million dollar lawsuits. We don't waste our time on minimum wage disputes or tenant squabbles. The boy's lower lip quivered, but he stood his ground, a spark of defiance flickering in his eyes. But isn't justice supposed to be for everyone? That's what they teach us in school. Maxwell's expression hardened, his voice dripping with condescension. Ah, the naivety of youth. Justice, my dear boy, is a commodity like any other. It's available to those who can afford it. Your school teachers, bless their hearts, are selling you a fairy tale. In the real world, justice is served to the highest bidder. Tommy's small fists clenched at his sides, a mix of anger and helplessness washing over him. That's not right, he murmured, more to himself than to the imposing figure before him. Right? Wrong? These are subjective concepts, Maxwell scoffed. What matters in this world is power, influence, and cold, hard cash, none of which you or your mother seem to possess. Now, I've wasted enough time on this little charade. Jennifer, he called out to his assistant. Please see this young man out, and in the future, let's try to maintain a more selective clientele, shall we? As the assistant gently but firmly guided Tommy towards the exit, Maxwell turned on his heel, ready to retreat to the sanctuary of his corner office. But something made him pause, a nagging sensation he couldn't quite place. He glanced back over his shoulder, catching a final glimpse of the boy's retreating figure. For a fleeting moment, something stirred within Maxwell's hardened heart. A distant memory, perhaps, or a flicker of the idealism he'd long since abandoned. But as quickly as it appeared, he quashed it 
burying it beneath layers of cynicism and ambition. Back in his office, Maxwell tried to shake off the encounter, immersing himself in the details of his latest high-profile case. But as he pored over financial statements and legal precedents, he found his mind wandering. The boy's words echoed in his head, isn't justice supposed to be for everyone? Maxwell snorted, pushing the thought aside. He'd learned long ago that idealism had no place in the cutthroat world of corporate law. He'd clawed his way to the top, leaving behind any notions of fairness or equality. The weak were meant to be exploited, not protected. That was the natural order of things. As the day wore on, a parade of wealthy executives and corporate bigwigs filed in and out of Maxwell's office. Each meeting further cemented his reputation as the go-to lawyer for Boston's elite, the man who could make any legal problem disappear, for the right price, of course. Yet, with each handshake, each closed deal, each promise of exorbitant fees, Maxwell felt a growing sense of unease. The satisfaction he usually derived from these interactions seemed hollow, tainted somehow by the memory of a small boy's pleading eyes. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the city skyline, visible from his panoramic windows, Maxwell's assistant buzzed in on the intercom. Uh, Mr. Hartley, your five o'clock is here. Mr. Reginald Blackstone from Blackstone Industries. Maxwell's eyes lit up, pushing aside his lingering discomfort. Blackstone Industries was a pharmaceutical giant, and landing them as a client would be a major coup for the firm. He straightened his tie once more, plastered on his most charming smile, and strode towards the conference room. Reginald Blackstone was every bit the corporate titan Maxwell had imagined, silver-haired, impeccably dressed, with an air of authority that seemed to fill the room. As they shook hands, Maxwell could practically feel the weight of the potential sibillable hours in his grasp. Mr. Blackstone. It's an honor to meet you, Maxwell began, gesturing for the older man to take a seat. I understand you have some delicate matters that require our expertise. Blackstone nodded gravely, his steel-gray eyes boring into Maxwell. Indeed, Mr. Hartley, your reputation precedes you. I'm told you're the man to see when one needs to navigate, shall we say, murky waters? Maxwell leaned forward, his voice lowered conspiratorially. You've come to the right place, Mr. Blackstone. At Hartley & Associates, we specialize in turning murky waters crystal clear. Why don't you tell me what's troubling you, and we'll see how we can help. As Blackstone began to outline his company's predicament, a potentially damaging class action lawsuit related to one of their drugs. Maxwell listened intently, his mind already racing with strategies and loopholes. This was what he lived for, high stakes legal chess, with millions of dollars on the line. But as the meeting progressed, a strange unease began to creep over Maxwell. Something about Blackstone's cavalier attitude towards the patients, affected by the drug's side effects, struck a discordant note. The executive spoke of lives ruined and families torn apart, as if they were mere inconveniences, obstacles to be overcome on the path to greater profits. For the first time in years, Maxwell found himself struggling to maintain his professional mask. Images of Tommy, the boy from earlier in the day, kept intruding on his thoughts. Because What if it had been Tommy's mother affected by this drug? What if it had been Maxwell's own family? As Blackstone concluded his presentation, he fixed Maxwell with an expectant stare. So, Mr. Hartley, can you make this go away? Uh, he, uh, Maxwell opened his mouth to give his usual assurances, the well-practiced spiel about the firm's track record, and his own personal guarantee of success. But the words stuck in his throat. In that moment, he saw himself as if from a great distance, a man who had lost his way, who had forgotten why he'd become a lawyer in the first place. Oh, Mr. Blackstone, Maxwell heard himself say, his voice steady despite the turmoil in his mind, I believe we need to approach this situation from a different angle. Have you considered the possibility of a fair settlement with the affected parties? A chance to make things right? Blackstone's eyebrows shot up in surprise. Make things right? Mr. Hartley, I came here to make this problem disappear, 
not to open our coffers to every ambulance chaser in the state. Perhaps I've misunderstood your firm's reputation. Maxwell took a deep breath, feeling as though he stood on the edge of a precipice. The next words out of his mouth could very well determine the course of his career, his legacy, and perhaps even his soul. Mr. Blackstone, he began, his voice gaining strength with each word, our firm's reputation is built on getting results for our clients, but sometimes the best result isn't just about winning a case or avoiding liability. It's about doing what's right, both legally and ethically. As Maxwell continued to outline a strategy that balanced the company's interests with the needs of those affected by the drug, he felt a weight lifting from his shoulders. For the first time in years, he remembered why he'd gone into law in the first place, not to accumulate wealth and power, but to fight for justice, to be a voice for those who couldn't speak for themselves. The meeting concluded with Blackstone looking thoughtful, if not entirely convinced. As Maxwell walked him to the elevator, the older man paused. You've given me a lot to think about, Hartley. It's not what I expected, but perhaps that's not a bad thing. As the elevator doors closed, Maxwell stood alone in the hallway, his mind reeling from the day's events. He thought of Tommy, of Blackstone, of all the clients he'd represented over the years without ever questioning the morality of their actions or his own. With a sense of purpose he hadn't felt in years, Maxwell returned to his office and picked up the phone. Jennifer, he said to his assistant, cancel my dinner reservations, and first thing tomorrow I want you to track down that boy who came in earlier. Tommy, tell him I'd like to speak with him and his mother. As he hung up the phone, Maxwell gazed out at the Boston skyline, the city lights twinkling like stars. He realized that this day, which had started like any other, had become a turning point in his life. The path ahead was uncertain, but for the first time in a long time, Maxwell Hartley felt like he was heading in the right direction. The following morning dawned crisp and clear, a rarity for Boston's typically fickle weather. As Maxwell Hartley strode into his office, his usual air of arrogant confidence was tinged with something new, a sense of anticipation, perhaps even nervousness. Jennifer, he called out to his assistant as he passed her desk, any luck tracking down that boy from yesterday? Jennifer looked up, surprise evident in her eyes. It wasn't like Maxwell to follow up on pro bono cases, let alone ones he'd initially dismissed. Yes, Mr. Hartley. Tommy and his mother Sarah will be here at 10 a.m. I've cleared your schedule for the morning. Maxwell nodded, a small smile playing at the corners of his mouth. Excellent work, Jennifer. Thank you. As he settled into his office, Maxwell found himself staring at the wall of awards and accolades that had defined his career. National Litigator of the Year, Boston's most influential under 40, various plaques commemorating landmark cases won and fortunes saved for wealthy clients. For the first time, he wondered what they really meant. At precisely 10 a.m., there was a soft knock on his door. Jennifer ushered in Tommy and a woman who could only be his mother, Sarah. The contrast between this entrance and Tommy's previous visit was stark. The boy still looked nervous, but there was a glimmer of hope in his eyes. Sarah, a petite woman with kind eyes and worry lines etched into her face, stood protectively close to her son. Maxwell rose from behind his desk, extending his hand. Mrs. Sarah, Tommy, thank you for coming. Please have a seat. As they settled into the plush leather chairs across from him, Maxwell took a deep breath. I owe you both an apology. He began, his voice uncharacteristically soft. Tommy, the way I treated you yesterday was inexcusable. I've spent so long in this world of high-stakes litigation that I'd forgotten why I became a lawyer in the first place. Sarah's eyebrows furrowed in confusion. I don't understand, Mr. Hartley. Tommy told me what happened yesterday. Why the sudden change of heart? Maxwell leaned back in his chair, his gaze drifting to the Boston skyline, visible through his office window. Let's just say your son's visit was a wake-up call, a reminder that the law isn't just about winning cases or making money. It's about justice, about helping those who need it most. He turned back to face them, his expression earnest. 
If you're willing, I'd like to hear your story. And if I can, I'd like to help. For the next hour, Maxwell listened intently as Sarah poured out her tale. She was a single mother, working two jobs to make ends meet, days as a nurse's aide at a local hospital, nights waiting tables at a diner. Her boss at the diner, a man named Frank Walters, had been systematically underpaying his staff, particularly the women and immigrants who made up the bulk of his workforce. When I tried to speak up to organize the other workers, Sarah explained, her voice trembling, Frank threatened to fire me. He said he'd make sure I never worked in another restaurant in Boston again. With Tommy to support and our rent due, I couldn't risk it. As she spoke, Maxwell felt a growing sense of outrage. This was exactly the kind of injustice he'd once sworn to fight against, before the allure of corporate law and its hefty paychecks had seduced him away from his ideals. Sarah, he said as she finished her story, what Frank is doing is illegal. It's wage theft, plain and simple. And his threats, that's retaliation against a whistleblower. We have a strong case here. Tommy, who had been silent throughout his mother's recounting, suddenly spoke up. You mean you'll help us, Mr. Hartley? For real? Maxwell smiled, a genuine warmth in his eyes that had been absent for far too long. Yes, Tommy, I'll help you. And not just you and your mother. We're going to help all the workers at that diner. We're going to make this right. As Sarah and Tommy left his office, their faces alight with hope, Maxwell felt a surge of energy he hadn't experienced in years. He buzzed Jennifer on the intercom. Cancel my afternoon appointments and get me everything you can find on Frank Walters and his diner. We've got work to do. For the rest of the day, Maxwell threw himself into research, poring over labor laws and precedents. He called in favors from contacts at the Department of Labor, gathering evidence of Frank's systematic wage theft. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across his office, Maxwell sat back, rubbing his tired eyes. On his desk lay the beginnings of a case that could not only help Sarah and her co-workers, but potentially set a precedent for workers' rights across the city. It wasn't the multi-million dollar lawsuit he was used to, but somehow it felt more important than any case he'd handled in years. As he packed up his briefcase, preparing to head home, Maxwell paused at the door of his office. His gaze fell on the wall of awards once more. With a decisive motion, he strode over and took down the National Litigator of the Year plaque. In its place, he hung a framed copy of the Constitution. Time to remember what this is all about, he murmured to himself. The next few weeks were a whirlwind of activity. Maxwell assembled a small team of junior associates, bright young lawyers who had joined the firm with dreams of making a difference, only to find themselves buried in corporate paperwork. Now, their eyes shone with renewed purpose as they dove into the case. Emily Chen, a sharp-minded second-year associate, proved particularly invaluable. Her meticulous research uncovered a pattern of wage theft that extended far beyond Frank's Diner, implicating several other restaurants in the area. Mr. Hartley, Emily said one afternoon, her voice tinged with excitement. I think we've stumbled onto something big here. This isn't just about one bad employer, it's systemic. Maxwell nodded, a grim smile on his face. I had a feeling it might be. Good work, Emily. This changes things. We're not just fighting for Sarah and her co-workers anymore. We're looking at a potential class action that could affect hundreds, maybe thousands of workers across the city. As word of their investigation spread, more workers came forward with their stories. Maxwell's office became a hub of activity, with a steady stream of waiters, cooks, and dishwashers sharing tales of exploitation and fear. One evening, as Maxwell was preparing to leave the office, he found Tommy waiting for him in the lobby. The boy's face was a mixture of excitement and concern. Mr. Hartley, Tommy said, his voice urgent. I heard some of the guys at school talking. Their parents work at other restaurants, and they're going through the same thing as my mom, but they're scared to come forward. They think they'll lose their jobs. Maxwell knelt down to Tommy's level, placing a hand on his shoulder. Tommy, I want you to listen to me. What you just told me is very important. It's also very brave of you to come here and share this information. Can you do something for me? Tommy nodded eagerly. 
Tell your friends that their parents can come to us. We'll protect them, we'll fight for them, and we'll make sure that no one loses their job for standing up for what's right. Can you do that? Tommy's face lit up with a determined smile. Yes, sir, I can do that. As Tommy left, Maxwell felt a swell of pride. The boy he had once dismissed so callously was now becoming a crucial part of their fight for justice. The case was gaining momentum, but so was the pushback. Frank Walters had hired a team of high-powered attorneys, and rumors were circulating that some of Boston's most influential restaurateurs were pooling resources to fight the potential class action. One morning, Maxwell arrived at the office to find Jennifer waiting for him, her face tight with concern. Mr. Hartley, there's someone here to see you, Mr. Reginald Blackstone. Maxwell felt a knot form in his stomach. He hadn't spoken to Blackstone since that fateful meeting when he'd turned down the pharmaceutical case. Send him in, Jennifer. Blackstone strode into the office, his silver hair impeccably coiffed, his suit as expensive as ever. But there was an edge to his smile that hadn't been there before. Maxwell, my boy, he began, his tone deceptively jovial. I hear you've been making quite a stir in our fair city, championing the rights of, what do they call them, the working class? Maxwell straightened, meeting Blackstone's gaze steadily. That's right, Mr. Blackstone. Is there something I can help you with? Blackstone's smile faded, his eyes turning cold. You can help yourself, Maxwell. This little crusade of yours, it's admirable, I'm sure. But it's making some very important people very nervous. People who have long memories and deep pockets. Are you threatening me, Mr. Blackstone? Maxwell asked, his voice low but firm. Threatening? Oh no, my dear boy. Consider this a friendly warning from one businessman to another. There are forces at play here bigger than you realize. Forces that keep this city running smoothly. Rock the boat too much and you might find yourself capsized. As Blackstone turned to leave, he paused at the door. Think about your future, Maxwell, about the reputation you've built. Is it really worth throwing it all away for a bunch of waiters and dishwashers? The door clicked shut behind him, leaving Maxwell alone with his thoughts. For a moment, doubt crept in. Was he making a mistake? Was the price of this newfound conscience too high? But then, his eyes fell on a small, framed photo on his desk, a new addition to his office decor. It showed Tommy and Sarah, their faces beaming with hope and gratitude. Beside it lay a handwritten note from Tommy. Thank you for believing in us, Mr. Hartley. Maxwell's resolve hardened. He picked up his phone and dialed Emily's extension. Emily, gather the team. We need to go over everything again. If they're pushing back this hard, it means we're onto something big. As he hung up, Maxwell's gaze drifted to the Boston skyline outside his window. The city he'd called home for so long suddenly seemed different. A complex web of power, money, and long-held secrets. He realized that this case was no longer just about Sarah and her co-workers. It was about challenging a system that had allowed exploitation to thrive unchecked for far too long. The path ahead would be fraught with danger and uncertainty. But for the first time in years, Maxwell Hartley felt truly alive. He was no longer just winning cases. He was fighting for something he believed in. As his team filed into the conference room, their faces a mixture of determination and apprehension, Maxwell felt a surge of pride. These young lawyers, once cogs in the corporate machine, were now on the front lines of a battle for justice. All right, team, Maxwell began, his voice steady and resolute. We knew this wasn't going to be easy, but what we're doing here, it's important, it's necessary, and it's long overdue. So let's get to work. We've got a city to change. As they dove back into their research and strategy sessions, Maxwell couldn't shake the feeling that he was standing on the precipice of something much bigger than himself. The real test of his newfound principles was yet to come and it would shake the very foundations of everything he thought he knew about justice, power, and redemption. Hash. A Lawyer's Redemption, Part 3, The Resistance. As the weeks passed, Maxwell Hartley found himself in unfamiliar territory. 
The plush corner office that had been his sanctuary for so long now felt more like a war room. Maps of Boston's restaurant districts covered one wall, dotted with pins representing potential witnesses and victims of wage theft. The other walls were plastered with labor law statutes, case precedents, and timelines of Frank Walters' alleged misdeeds. The case against Frank Walters had grown far beyond its initial scope. What had started as a single instance of wage theft at one diner had ballooned into a class action lawsuit representing dozens of workers from across Boston's restaurant industry. Each day brought new revelations, new victims, and new challenges. Maxwell's team worked tirelessly, often burning the midnight oil as they built their case. Emily Chen had proven herself invaluable, her keen analytical mind uncovering patterns of exploitation that spanned years and crossed multiple establishments. Mr. Hartley, Emily said one evening, her eyes bright with excitement despite the late hour, I think I found something big. Look at these financial records from the past five years. There's a pattern here. Every time minimum wage laws were set to change, there's a spike in reported breakages and inventory losses across multiple restaurants. It's like they were preemptively offsetting the wage increases. Maxwell leaned in, examining the data. Good work, Emily. This could be crucial. It shows intent. They weren't just making mistakes. They were deliberately manipulating the system. As the case built momentum, so did the resistance. Frank Walters had hired Victoria Hawthorne, a cutthroat litigator known for her ruthless tactics. Rumors circulated that some of Boston's most powerful restaurateurs were pooling resources to fight the lawsuit, seeing it as a threat to their way of doing business. One morning, Maxwell arrived at the office to find Sarah waiting for him, her face pale with worry. Mr. Hartley, she said, her voice trembling, something's happened. Frank, um, 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 um. he came to the diner last night. He didn't do anything, just stood there watching me work. But the way he looked at me, I'm scared, Mr. Hartley, for me and for Tommy. Maxwell felt a surge of anger, quickly replaced by determination. Sarah, listen to me. What Frank did, that's intimidation. It's illegal, and we're going to use it against him. But more importantly, we're going to keep you and Tommy safe. I promise you that. He immediately set about arranging protection for Sarah and Tommy, calling in favors from old contacts in law enforcement. As he worked, Maxwell couldn't help but reflect on how much had changed. Just months ago, he wouldn't have given a second thought to the fears of a single mother working as a waitress. Now, her safety and well-being were his top priority. As word of Frank's intimidation tactics spread, something unexpected began to happen. Instead of cowering in fear, more workers started coming forward. It was as if Frank's actions had ignited a spark of defiance in the very people he sought to silence. Maria, a line cook from a high-end restaurant downtown, was one such voice. I've been quiet for too long, she told Maxwell during a late night deposition, watching Sarah stand up to Frank. It made me realize we don't have to take this anymore. There are more of us than there are of them. It's time we stood together. Maxwell nodded, feeling a swell of pride. You're absolutely right, Maria, and we're going to make sure your voice is heard. The next day, Maxwell called a meeting with his team. We need to change our strategy, he announced. This case isn't just about wage theft anymore. It's about empowerment. It's about giving a voice to those who've been silenced for too long. I want to hear your ideas on how we can amplify these workers' stories. The team buzzed with excitement, throwing out suggestions ranging from media campaigns to community outreach programs. As Maxwell listened, he felt a renewed sense of purpose. This was why he'd become a lawyer in the first place, to make a real difference in people's lives. However, as the case gained more attention, the pushback intensified. Maxwell began receiving anonymous threats, first phone calls, then notes left on his car. He brushed them off, more concerned with the safety of his clients than his own. But then came the night that changed everything. Maxwell was working late, poring over depositions, when he heard a commotion outside. He rushed to the window just in time to see a group of masked figures fleeing the scene. 
in their wake, they left a chilling message spray painted across the front of the building, back off or else. As he stood there, staring at the graffiti, Maxwell felt a mix of anger and determination. They were getting desperate, resorting to thuggish tactics. It meant they were afraid. It meant he was getting close. The next morning, as news of the vandalism spread, Maxwell expected his team to be shaken. Instead, he found them more determined than ever. Emily, in particular, seemed fired up. They think they can scare us off, she said, her voice filled with righteous indignation. Well, they've got another thing coming. We're not backing down. Not now, not ever. Maxwell smiled, feeling a surge of pride in his young protege. You're right, Emily. In fact, we're going to use this to our advantage. Their desperation is showing, and we're going to make sure everyone sees it. He immediately called a press conference, standing in front of the vandalized building as he addressed the media. What you see behind me, he said, his voice steady and resolute, is not just an act of vandalism, it's an act of desperation by those who fear the truth. They think they can intimidate us into silence. But let me be clear, we will not be silenced. We will not back down and we will not rest until justice is served for every worker who has been exploited and abused. The press conference became a rallying cry. Workers from across the city, emboldened by Maxwell's words, began organizing. Protests sprang up outside Frank Walter's diner and other establishments implicated in the lawsuit. The once invisible workforce was making itself heard and Boston was listening. As the movement grew, Maxwell found himself thrust into a new role, not just a lawyer, but a leader in a fight for social justice. It was a position he never expected to be in, but one he embraced with all his heart. One evening, as he was leaving the office, Maxwell found Tommy waiting for him in the lobby. The boy's face was serious, his eyes filled with a maturity beyond his years. Do I? Mr. Hartley, Tommy said, I wanted to thank you, not just for helping my mom, but for everything you're doing, the kids at school, their parents, Everyone's talking about it. You're changing things. You're making a difference. Maxwell knelt down, placing a hand on Tommy's shoulder. Tommy, listen to me. I'm not the one making a difference. Your mom, the other workers who've come forward. You, you're the ones changing things. I'm just helping to amplify your voices. Never forget that. As Tommy left, Maxwell stood there for a moment, reflecting on how far they'd come. From a chance encounter with a desperate boy to a movement that was shaking the foundations of the city, it was more than he ever could have imagined. But he knew the real battle was still ahead. The court date was approaching, and Frank Walters and his powerful allies would throw everything they had at stopping them. The next few weeks would determine whether their fight for justice would succeed, or if the system would once again protect those in power at the expense of the vulnerable. As Maxwell headed home, the weight of responsibility heavy on his shoulders, he couldn't help but feel a sense of anticipation. Whatever challenges lay ahead, he was ready to face them. For the first time in his career, he was fighting for something bigger than himself, and it felt right. Little did he know that the true test of his newfound principles was yet to come, and it would shake the very foundations of everything he thought he knew about justice, power, and redemption. Hash. A Lawyer's Redemption, Part 4, The Crucible. The Boston County Courthouse loomed before Maxwell Hartley, its neoclassical facade a stark reminder of the weight of history and justice. As he climbed the worn marble steps, briefcase in hand, Maxwell felt the eyes of the gathered crowd upon him. Supporters and protesters alike had assembled, their competing chants creating a cacophony that echoed off the building's stone walls. Order in the court, justice for workers, came the cries from one side. Hartley's a fraud, protect our businesses, shouted the opposition. Maxwell paused at the top of the steps, taking in the scene. Just months ago, he would have scoffed at such a display, seeing it as nothing more than a nuisance, a distraction from the real work of law that happened behind closed doors in wood-paneled offices. Now he understood. This was democracy in action, the voice of the people demanding to be heard. As he turned to enter the courthouse, 
he caught sight of a familiar face in the crowd. Tommy stood there, flanked by his mother Sarah and a group of other workers. The boy gave Maxwell a thumbs up, his face beaming with hope and determination. Maxwell nodded in return, drawing strength from the gesture. Inside, the courtroom was a hive of activity. Maxwell's team bustled about, making last-minute preparations. Emily Chen approached, her usually calm demeanor tinged with nervous energy. Mr. Hartley, she said, her voice low, we've got a problem. Two of our key witnesses, Maria from the downtown restaurant and Jorge from the hotel kitchen, they didn't show up this morning. Their families say they never came home last night. Maxwell felt a chill run down his spine. This was no coincidence. Have you contacted the police? Emily nodded. They're looking into it, but... She trailed off, the implication clear. Time was not on their side. All right, Maxwell said, his mind racing. We'll have to adjust our strategy. Get the rest of the team together. We've got 10 minutes before... Th As Emily hurried off, Maxwell caught sight of Frank Walters and his legal team entering the courtroom. Frank swaggered in, a smug smile playing on his lips as he took his seat. Beside him sat Victoria Hawthorne, her steel-gray hair pulled back in a severe bun, her eyes cold and calculating as they swept the room. Maxwell felt a familiar spark of competitive fire ignite within him. In another life, he might have been on the other side of this case, using every trick in the book to protect wealthy clients from the consequences of their actions. Now, he was David facing Goliath, armed with nothing but the truth and a newfound sense of justice. The bailiff's voice rang out. All rise. The Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is now in session, the Honorable Judge Eleanor Blackwood presiding. Judge Blackwood, a formidable woman in her 60s with a reputation for no-nonsense rulings, took her seat. Her piercing gaze swept the courtroom before settling on the attorneys. Counselors, are you ready to proceed? Maxwell stood. Yes, Your Honor. Victoria Hawthorne rose as well. Ready, Your Honor. Very well, Judge Blackwood said. Mr. Hartley, as the plaintiff's counsel, you may present your opening statement. Maxwell approached the jury box, feeling the weight of countless hopes and fears resting on his shoulders. He took a deep breath, centered himself, and began. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this case is about more than just unpaid wages or unfair labor practices. It's about the very soul of our city, about what kind of community we want to be. He paused, letting his words sink in. Over the course of this trial, you will hear testimony from dozens of workers, hardworking men and women who have been systematically exploited, their rights trampled, their dignity stripped away by employers who saw them not as human beings, but as disposable resources to be used and discarded. As Maxwell laid out the details of the case, he could see the jurors leaning in, their expressions a mix of shock and outrage as he described the patterns of abuse and exploitation that had gone unchecked for years. But this case is also about courage, Maxwell continued, his voice rising with passion. The courage of Sarah, of Tommy, of every plaintiff who dared to stand up and say, enough. They risked everything, their jobs, their reputations, their future in this industry, not just for themselves, but for every worker who has ever been exploited, every voice that has been silenced by fear or desperation. As he concluded his opening statement, Maxwell could feel the energy in the room had shifted. The jury was engaged, their eyes alight with interest and concern. Even Judge Blackwood, known for her impassivity, seemed to be listening intently but Victoria Hawthorne was not one to be easily outdone. As she rose for the defense's opening statement, her voice cut through the courtroom like a scalpel. Mr. Hartley paints a compelling picture, she began, her tone dripping with sarcasm. A David and Goliath story of downtrodden workers rising up against oppressive employers. It's the stuff of Hollywood movies. But this is not a movie, ladies and gentlemen. This is a court of law where facts matter more than emotional appeals. Victoria went on to paint Frank Walters and the other defendants as hardworking business owners, job creators who were being unfairly targeted by opportunistic employees and a lawyer looking to make a name for himself. 
The plaintiffs in this case, Victoria said, her voice full of disdain, are not the victims Mr. Hartley would have you believe. They are individuals with checkered work histories, many with multiple jobs and questionable immigration statuses. They saw an opportunity to exploit the system, to squeeze money from honest business owners, and they took it. Maxwell felt his blood boil at Victoria's characterization of the workers, but he forced himself to remain calm. He had anticipated this line of attack. Now it was time to let the evidence speak for itself. As the trial progressed over the next few days, Maxwell and his team presented a meticulous case. Financial records showed clear patterns of wage theft. Former managers testified to receiving explicit instructions to manipulate time cards and deny overtime. Workers shared heartbreaking stories of struggling to make ends meet while working grueling hours for less than minimum wage. But Victoria Hawthorne was relentless. She attacked the credibility of every witness, exploiting inconsistencies in testimonies and painting the workers as unreliable and self-serving. She brought in expert witnesses who spoke about the razor-thin profit margins in the restaurant industry, arguing that the alleged wage theft was nothing more than necessary cost-cutting measures to keep businesses afloat. The turning point came on the fourth day of the trial. Maxwell had just finished questioning a former assistant manager who had provided damning testimony about Frank Walter's illegal practices when Victoria stood for cross-examination. Mr. Rodriguez, Victoria began, her voice silky smooth, you testified that you witnessed Mr. Walters instructing managers to alter time cards. Can you provide any physical evidence of these instructions? The witness shifted uncomfortably. No, ma'am. The instructions were always verbal. Victoria pounced. So we're just supposed to take your word for it? The word of a man who was fired for theft? Maxwell shot to his feet. Objection, Your Honor. Counsel is attempting to introduce prejudicial information not in evidence. Sustained, Judge Blackwood said sharply. The jury will disregard the last statement. Miss Hawthorne, stick to the facts in evidence. But the damage was done. Maxwell could see the doubt creeping into the juror's eyes. He knew he needed something big to turn the tide. That night, as Maxwell pored over case files in his office, searching for a new angle, there was a knock at the door. It was Emily, her face flushed with excitement. Mr. Hartley, you need to see this, she said, thrusting a USB drive into his hands. It just came in from an anonymous source. It's, it's everything we need. Maxwell plugged in the drive and his eyes widened as he scrolled through the files. Internal emails, memos, detailed instructions on how to manipulate payroll systems. It was a treasure trove of evidence that definitively proved not just Frank Walter's guilt, but the involvement of several other prominent restaurant owners in a citywide wage theft scheme. Emily, this is... Where did this come from? Maxwell asked, his mind racing with the implications. Emily shook her head. The source wants to remain anonymous, but they left a note. It says, do the right thing, make them pay. Maxwell sat back, conflicted. The evidence was exactly what they needed to win the case, to bring justice to thousands of exploited workers. But using anonymously provided evidence was ethically murky at best, potentially inadmissible at worst. As he wrestled with the decision, Maxwell's eyes fell on the photo of Tommy and Sarah on his desk. He thought of all the workers who had risked everything to come forward, of Maria and Jorge, who had mysteriously disappeared before they could testify. With a heavy sigh, Maxwell made his decision. Emily, get the team together. We've got a long night ahead of us. We're going to go through every piece of this evidence, verify what we can, and prepare to present it to the court tomorrow. But we're also going to be completely transparent about its origins. We'll let the judge decide if it's admissible. The next morning, as Maxwell stood before Judge Blackwood, to present the new evidence, he could feel the tension in the courtroom. Victoria Hawthorne was on her feet immediately, objecting vehemently to the introduction of anonymously sourced materials. Judge Blackwood listened to both sides, her expression inscrutable. Finally, she spoke. While I share Miss Hawthorne's concerns about the provenance of this evidence, 
I believe its potential relevance to this case outweighs those concerns. I will allow it, but with the following conditions, the jury will be instructed to consider the anonymous nature of the source when evaluating the evidence, and both sides will be given adequate time to review and respond to the new materials. As Maxwell began presenting the new evidence, he could see the shift in the courtroom. The jurors leaned forward, their expressions shocked as they absorbed the extent of the wage theft scheme. Even Victoria Hawthorne seemed rattled, her usual poise slipping as she frantically whispered with her team. Frank Walters, who had maintained a smug demeanor throughout the trial, now sat ashen-faced, the reality of his situation finally sinking in. As the day's session came to a close, Maxwell felt a mix of exhaustion and exhilaration. They had taken a risk, but it had paid off. The tide had turned in their favor. But as he packed up his briefcase, Maxwell noticed Judge Blackwood beckoning him and Victoria to approach the bench. Counselors, she said, her voice low and serious, I want to see both of you in my chambers first thing tomorrow morning. There have been developments that we need to discuss. As Maxwell left the courthouse that evening, his mind racing with possibilities, he couldn't shake the feeling that the real battle was just beginning. The case had grown beyond a simple lawsuit, touching on issues of corporate power, workers' rights, and the very nature of justice in America. Whatever Judge Blackwood had to say tomorrow, Maxwell knew one thing for certain, there was no going back. He had chosen his path, and he would see it through to the end, whatever the cost. Hash. A Lawyer's Redemption, Part 5, The Revelation. The early morning sun had barely crept over Boston's skyline when Maxwell Hartley arrived at the courthouse. The corridors were eerily quiet, a stark contrast to the bustling activity of the trial days. His footsteps echoed off the marble floors as he made his way to Judge Blackwood's chambers. Victoria Hawthorne was already there, her usual impeccable appearance slightly disheveled, betraying a night of little sleep. They exchanged tense nods before Judge Blackwood's clerk ushered them inside. Judge Blackwood sat behind her massive oak desk, her face grave. Thank you for coming early, counselors. Please sit down. As they took their seats, Maxwell noticed a third person in the room, a man in a dark suit who stood silently in the corner, his expression unreadable. Before we begin, Judge Blackwood said, her voice low and serious, I want to introduce you to Agent Carlson from the FBI. What I'm about to share with you goes beyond the scope of this trial and enters the realm of federal investigation. Maxwell felt a chill run down his spine. He glanced at Victoria, seeing his own shock mirrored in her face. Judge Blackwood continued, The evidence that was anonymously submitted to Mr. Hartley's team, it didn't just expose wage theft. It uncovered a web of corruption that extends to some of the highest levels of our city government. Agent Carlson stepped forward, his voice steady and professional. We've been investigating a racketeering operation in Boston for months. Your trial, Mr. Hartley, and the evidence you've uncovered has blown the case wide open. We're looking at a conspiracy involving not just restaurant owners, but city officials, health inspectors, even members of the police force. Maxwell's mind reeled. He had known they were fighting against powerful interests, but this, this was beyond anything he had imagined. Victoria spoke up, her voice sharp. And how exactly does this affect our trial, Your Honor? Judge Blackwood sighed heavily. That's what we need to discuss. This trial has become a linchpin in a federal investigation. The FBI wants us to continue to maintain our focus on the wage theft aspect while they build their larger case. But you both need to be aware of the broader context and the potential dangers. Dangers? Maxwell asked, a knot forming in his stomach. Agent Carlson nodded grimly. Mr. Hartley, Miss Hawthorne, I won't sugarcoat this. The people involved in this conspiracy are powerful and desperate. We have reason to believe they're behind the disappearance of your witnesses, Mr. Hartley, and they may not stop there. The implications hung heavy in the air. Maxwell thought of Sarah and Tommy, of Emily and the rest of his team. They had all put themselves on the line for this case, and now the stakes had risen exponentially. So what happens now? 
Victoria asked, her usual bravado subdued. Judge Blackwood leaned forward, her gaze intense. We proceed with the trial, but with heightened security measures. Agent Carlson's team will be providing protection for key individuals involved, and both of you will need to adjust your strategies in light of this new information. As they left the judge's chambers, Maxwell and Victoria found themselves walking side by side down the empty corridor. For a moment, the adversarial tension between them dissolved, replaced by a shared sense of shock and responsibility. Hartley, Victoria said quietly, I hope you know what you're doing. This isn't just a case anymore. It's a powder keg. Maxwell nodded, his voice equally low. I know, but we can't back down now. Too many people are counting on us. Victoria gave him a long look, then nodded curtly before striding away. As Maxwell made his way back to his office, his mind raced. He needed to brief his team to prepare them for what lay ahead. But first, he had a call to make. Sarah answered on the second ring, her voice thick with sleep. Mr. Hartley, is everything okay? Sarah, listen carefully, Maxwell said, trying to keep his voice calm. I need you and Tommy to pack a bag. A federal agent will be at your house in an hour to take you to a safe location. There was a pause, then Sarah's voice came back, steady and resolved. We'll be ready. As he hung up, Maxwell felt a mix of guilt and determination. He had brought Sarah and Tommy into this fight, and now he had to make sure they came through it safely. The next few days of the trial were a balancing act of legal strategy and barely concealed tension. Maxwell presented his case with renewed vigor, the weight of the larger conspiracy, adding urgency to every argument. Victoria fought back hard, but he could see the conflict in her eyes. She was a skilled lawyer, used to winning at all costs, but now she was grappling with the possibility that her client was involved in something far darker than wage theft. On the fifth day of the trial, as Maxwell cross-examined a particularly evasive witness, the payroll manager for one of Frank Walter's restaurants, he noticed a commotion at the back of the courtroom. Emily was urgently waving him over. Your Honor, may I request a brief recess? Maxwell asked. Judge Blackwood, seeming to sense the urgency, nodded. We'll take a 15-minute recess. As soon as they were out of the courtroom, Emily pulled Maxwell into a side room, her face pale. Mr. Hartley, Maria and Jorge, they've been found. Maxwell's heart leapt. Are they all right? Where were they? Emily shook her head, her voice trembling. They're alive, but... Mr. Hartley, they were being held in the basement of one of Frank Walter's restaurants. The FBI raided the place an hour ago. The implications hit Maxwell like a physical blow. This wasn't just about wage theft anymore. They were dealing with kidnapping, false imprisonment crimes that went far beyond labor violations. There's more, Emily continued. They found documents, Mr. Hartley, ledgers, emails, it's all there. Proof of bribes to health inspectors, kickbacks to city officials. It's everything the FBI agent told you about, and more. Maxwell leaned against the wall, his mind racing. This changed everything. The trial, the media narrative, the potential consequences. It had all just escalated to a new level. As they re-entered the courtroom, Maxwell could feel the shift in energy. Word had clearly spread. Reporters were frantically typing on their phones. Spectators were whispering urgently to each other. Victoria Hawthorne stood by her table, her face ashen as she conferred with Frank Walters, whose smug demeanor had finally cracked, replaced by naked fear. Judge Blackwood called the court to order, her voice cutting through the murmurs. Counselors approached the bench. As Maxwell and Victoria stood before the judge, Blackwood spoke in low, urgent tones. I've just been briefed on the FBI raid. Given these developments, I'm calling a halt to these proceedings. We'll reconvene in 48 hours, during which time I expect both of you to reevaluate your positions in light of this new evidence. As the judge announced the recess to the court, chaos erupted. Reporters rushed for the doors, eager to break the story. Frank Walters was quickly surrounded by his legal team, their faces grim. Maxwell turned to find Emily by his side. What now, Mr. Hartley? He took a deep breath, squaring his shoulders. Now, Emily, 
We prepare for the fight of our lives. This isn't just about winning a case anymore. It's about exposing the truth, no matter where it leads. The next 48 hours were a whirlwind of activity. Maxwell's office became a hub of frantic energy as they pored over the new evidence, rewriting arguments, and preparing for the media storm that was already brewing. Reports of the FBI raid and the connection to the wage theft trial were splashed across every news outlet in Boston. Maxwell found himself thrust into the spotlight, giving interviews and press conferences, trying to balance the need for transparency with the ongoing legal proceedings. On the evening before the trial was set to resume, Maxwell sat alone in his office, the weight of responsibility heavy on his shoulders. He thought of how far they'd come, from that first encounter with Tommy to this moment on the precipice of exposing a citywide conspiracy. A knock at the door roused him from his thoughts. It was Reginald Blackstone, the pharmaceutical executive whose case Maxwell had turned down months ago, setting this whole journey in motion. May I come in, Maxwell? Blackstone asked, his usual commanding presence somewhat subdued. Maxwell nodded, gesturing to a chair. Blackstone settled in, his eyes roaming over the chaos of papers and evidence boards that filled the office. You've stirred up quite a hornet's nest, my boy. I don't think any of us realized just how deep this rot went. Us? Maxwell asked, his guard up. Blackstone sighed heavily. I won't insult your intelligence, Maxwell. I've had my fingers in many pies over the years, some less savory than others. But this? He gestured at the evidence of corruption spread across the room. This goes beyond anything I could have imagined. Why are you here, Mr. Blackstone? Maxwell asked, his voice tired but firm. To offer you a choice, Blackstone replied, leaning forward. You're on the verge of exposing a system that's been in place for decades. A system that's made a lot of powerful people very rich. They're scared, Maxwell, and scared people do desperate things. Maxwell felt a chill run down his spine. Is that a threat? Blackstone shook his head. No, my boy, it's a warning and an offer. There are those of us who see which way the wind is blowing. We want to be on the right side of history. I can provide you with information, evidence that will blow this case wide open, but it comes at a price. What price? Immunity, Blackstone said simply, for myself and a select few others. In exchange, we'll testify, provide everything we know about the corruption in this city. Maxwell sat back, his mind reeling. The offer was tempting. With Blackstone's evidence and testimony, they could expose the entire corrupt system, bring down not just Frank Walters, but the entire network that had enabled him. But could he make that deal? Could he let some of the guilty parties walk free in order to bring down the entire system? As the sun began to rise over Boston, painting the sky in hues of pink and gold, Maxwell made his decision. He picked up his phone and dialed Agent Carlson's number. Agent Carlson, this is Maxwell Hartley. We need to talk. I've got an offer that could break this case wide open, but we need to move fast. As he hung up, Maxwell looked out over the awakening city. Whatever happened in court today, he knew one thing for certain. Boston would never be the same again, and neither would he. Hash a Lawyer's Redemption, Part 6, The Reckoning. The Boston County Courthouse buzzed with an energy unlike anything it had seen in years. News vans crowded the street, their satellite dishes reaching towards the sky like metal trees. Protesters and supporters alike filled the steps, their chants creating a cacophony that echoed off the building's imposing facade. Maxwell Hartley stood at the top of the steps, taking in the scene. Just months ago, he would have scoffed at such a display. Now, he understood its importance. This wasn't just noise. It was the voice of a city demanding change. As he turned to enter the building, he caught sight of a familiar face in the crowd. Tommy stood there, flanked by his mother Sarah and a group of other workers. The boy gave Maxwell a thumbs up, his face beaming with hope and determination. Maxwell nodded in return, drawing strength from the gesture. Inside, the courtroom was packed to capacity. Maxwell's team bustled about, making last-minute preparations. Emily Chen approached, her usual calm demeanor tinged with nervous energy. Mr. Hartley, she said, her voice low, everything's in place. 
Agent Carlson confirmed that Blackstone and the others are ready to testify. Maxwell nodded, feeling the weight of the decision he'd made. After his conversation with Blackstone, he'd worked through the night with the FBI, crafting a deal that would grant limited immunity to Blackstone and a few others in exchange for their testimony. It was a compromise that sat uneasily with him, but one he believed was necessary to expose the full extent of the corruption. As he took his place at the plaintiff's table, Maxwell caught sight of Frank Walters and his legal team. Gone was Walters' smug confidence, replaced by a pallor of fear. Victoria Hawthorne sat beside him, her face a mask of professional detachment, but Maxwell could see the tension in her shoulders. The bailiff's voice rang out, All rise! The Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is now in session, the Honorable Judge Eleanor Blackwood presiding. Judge Blackwood took her seat, her piercing gaze sweeping the courtroom before settling on the attorneys. Counselors, in light of recent developments, I understand both sides have motions to present before we proceed. Mr. Hartley, you may begin. Maxwell stood, straightening his tie. Your Honor, in light of new evidence and witness testimony that has come to light, the plaintiffs move to expand the scope of this case. What began as a suit about wage theft has uncovered a conspiracy that reaches into the highest levels of our city government. We believe it is in the interest of justice to present all of this evidence to the court. Victoria Hawthorne was on her feet immediately. Objection, Your Honor. The defense hasn't been given adequate time to review this new evidence. We move for a continuance to properly prepare our response. Judge Blackwood considered for a moment, then spoke. Miss Hawthorne, given the serious nature of these allegations and the public interest in this case, I'm inclined to allow Mr. Hartley to proceed. However, I will grant the defense additional time to review the new evidence as it's presented. Mr. Hartley, you may call your first witness. Maxwell nodded, taking a deep breath. The plaintiffs call Reginald Blackstone to the stand. A murmur rippled through the courtroom as Blackstone made his way to the witness box. The powerful executive looked diminished somehow, the weight of his actions visible in the slump of his shoulders. As Maxwell began his questioning, Blackstone's testimony unfolded like a map of corruption. He spoke of backroom deals, of bribes paid to health inspectors and city officials, of a system designed to keep workers powerless and exploited while a select few profited. When he adds, Mr. Blackstone, Maxwell asked his voice steady, can you tell the court why you decided to come forward with this information? Blackstone paused, his eyes scanning the courtroom before settling on Maxwell. I've spent my life building wealth and power, Mr. Hartley. I told myself it was just business, that everyone played by these rules. But watching this trial, seeing the courage of these workers, I realized I couldn't keep lying to myself. What we did was wrong, and it's time for it to stop. As the day wore on, more witnesses took the stand. City officials, restaurant owners, even a former police captain, each one adding another piece to the puzzle of corruption that had plagued Boston for years. Victoria Hawthorne fought back hard, challenging the credibility of the witnesses, questioning the deals made for their testimony. But with each cross-examination, it became clear that she was fighting a losing battle. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the courtroom, Maxwell called his final witness. The plaintiffs call Sarah Reeves to the stand. Sarah walked to the witness box, her head held high, despite the nervousness visible in her trembling hands. As she was sworn in, her eyes found Tommy in the gallery, drawing strength from her son's presence. <sighs> Mrs. Reeves, Maxwell began gently. Can you tell the court about your experiences working at Frank Walter's diner? Sarah's voice started soft, but grew stronger as she spoke. She told of long hours and stolen wages, of the constant fear of losing her job if she spoke up. But she also spoke of solidarity, of workers supporting each other in small ways, sharing food when someone's paycheck was short, covering shifts when a coworker's child was sick. Why did you decide to be part of this lawsuit? Maxwell asked. Sarah's eyes welled with tears, but her voice remained steady. For my son, Tommy, I want him to grow up in a world where hard work is rewarded, where people are treated with dignity, and for all the other workers out there who are afraid to speak up, 
someone had to take a stand. As Sarah stepped down from the witness box, a hush fell over the courtroom. Maxwell could see the impact of her words on the jurors' faces. The story of corruption and greed had been laid bare, but it was Sarah's simple testimony that had brought it home on a human level. In his closing argument, Maxwell wove together the threads of testimony they'd heard over the past weeks. He spoke not just of wage theft and labor violations, but of a system that had lost its way, that had prioritized profit over people. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, he concluded, his voice resonating with conviction, today you have the power to send a message, a message that in this city, in this country, we value honest work, that we won't stand by while the most vulnerable among us are exploited. That justice is not just for those who can afford expensive lawyers, but for everyone who calls this nation home. The choice is yours. Thank you. As Maxwell returned to his seat, he could feel the energy in the room had shifted. Even Victoria Hawthorne's closing argument, usually a masterclass in legal maneuvering, seemed to fall flat in the face of the overwhelming evidence and testimony. The jury's deliberation was shockingly brief. In less than two hours, they returned with a verdict. On the charge of systematic wage theft, we find the defendant, Frank Walters, guilty. A cheer went up from the gallery, quickly silenced by Judge Blackwood's gavel. On the charge of conspiracy to violate labor laws, we find the defendant guilty. With each guilty verdict, Maxwell could see Frank Walters shrinking in his seat, the full weight of his actions finally crashing down upon him. But the judge wasn't finished. In light of the extensive evidence of corruption presented during this trial, I am recommending a full federal investigation into the practices of city officials and business leaders implicated in this conspiracy. This court will reconvene in 30 days to hear sentencing arguments. As the courtroom erupted in a mix of cheers and shocked murmurs, Maxwell felt a hand on his shoulder. It was Emily, her eyes shining with tears of joy. We did it, Mr. Hartley, we really did it. Outside the courthouse, Maxwell found himself surrounded by a sea of reporters, their questions coming at him in a rapid fire blur. But his attention was drawn to a small group standing off to the side, Sarah, Tommy, and several of the other workers who had testified. Excusing himself from the press, Maxwell made his way over to them. Before he could speak, he found himself enveloped in a group hug, words of thanks and congratulations washing over him. As the group dispersed, Tommy stepped forward, his young face serious. Mr. Hartley, he said, I wanted to thank you, not just for helping my mom, but for everything you've done. You've changed things. You've made a difference. Maxwell knelt down, placing a hand on Tommy's shoulder. Tommy, listen to me. I'm not the one who made the difference. Your mom, the other workers who came forward, you, you're the ones who changed things. I just helped amplify your voices. Never forget that. As Tommy nodded, his face breaking into a wide grin, Maxwell felt a sense of peace wash over him. He realized that this journey, which had begun with a chance encounter with a desperate boy, had transformed not just the city, but himself as well. In the weeks that followed, the ripple effects of the trial spread far and wide. The federal investigation expanded, leading to a wave of resignations and arrests among city officials and business leaders. Labor laws were strengthened, enforcement mechanisms overhauled. Maxwell found himself in a new role, not just a lawyer, but an advocate for workers' rights, in demand for speaking engagements and policy consultations. Hartley and Associates transformed as well, shifting its focus to labor law and social justice cases. One evening, as Maxwell sat in his office reviewing a new case, he heard a knock at the door. It was Reginald Blackstone. May I come in? Blackstone asked, his usual commanding presence softened by a new humility. Maxwell nodded, gesturing to a chair. Blackstone settled in, his eyes roaming over the changed office. Gone were the plaques and awards, replaced by thank you notes from workers and families Maxwell had helped. You've done good work, Maxwell, Blackstone said better than I think any of us could have imagined. Maxwell leaned back in his chair. We've made a start, Mr. Blackstone, but there's still a long way to go. 
Blackstone nodded, a wry smile on his face. Indeed there is, which is why I'm here. I've been doing a lot of thinking about legacy, about the kind of mark I want to leave on this world. I'd like to establish a foundation, a significant one dedicated to workers' rights, education, and community development. And I want you to help shape it, to guide its mission. Maxwell was taken aback. Why me? Because you've shown us all what's possible when someone with skill and influence decides to fight for what's right. Blackstone replied, I may be old, but I'm not too old to learn. What do you say? As they began to discuss possibilities, Maxwell felt a renewed sense of purpose. He realized that this wasn't an ending, but a new beginning. The fight for justice was far from over, but now they had new tools, new allies, and a city awakened to the need for change. Looking out over the Boston skyline, Maxwell thought about the journey that had brought him here. From a cynical corporate lawyer to a champion for the voiceless, he had found something he never knew he was missing. A sense of purpose, of fighting for something bigger than himself. And as the sun set over the city, painting the sky in hues of pink and gold, Maxwell Hartley smiled. The path ahead would be challenging, but he was ready. For the first time in his life, he wasn't just a successful lawyer. He was a man on a mission with the skills, the resources, and the heart to make a real difference. The story of the lawyer who found his conscience had become a beacon of hope, inspiring a new generation of advocates and change makers. And somewhere out there, a young Tommy was smiling, knowing that sometimes all it takes to change the world is the courage to knock on the right door. If you enjoyed this story, press on another video you see on the screen for more amazing tales. Until next time.